Jane Atkinson earned a 1971 bachelor's degree from Bryn Mawr College before completing MA and PhD degrees at Stanford. In 1978, she became an assistant professor of anthropology at Lewis and Clark College in Oregon, my own alma mater back in 1972. She went on to serve as chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, director of the Gender Studies Program, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and eventually became provost and vice president of the college in 2000. In 2009, she was named interim president of Lewis and Clark briefly, in between other outgoing and incoming college presidents, before going back to her provost job until her retirement in 2018. Atkinson published this article in 1983, shortly before she earned promotion and tenure at Lewis and Clark, and also expanded her work into a book and a number of other articles. This article provides a good starting point for considering how religion actually forms one of the institutional foundations for that complex concept we label ethnicity, and illustrates how and why people can use religion as one available cultural tool for constructing and maintaining their own ethnic identities. Although ethnicity can be based in different realms of social interaction, religion often forms one of the basic building blocks for this dimension of social life. From Jane Atkinson's article, we can take away the lesson so often learned from anthropologists. Sometimes what seems at first to be a strange, isolated and exotic case study with no relevance for our own contemporary lives turns out to give us a fresh perspective from which to view some of the most difficult and troubling issues we face ourselves. The exotic element appears right away here. We look all the way to the other side of the planet from American society to religious issues in Indonesia, a country cobbled together out of a vast collection of islands between Southeast Asia and Australia. This unlikely patchwork quilt of different cultural groups has managed to sew them together into the fourth largest country by population in the world, after China, India, and the United States. A dominant majority of the Indonesian population is Muslim, for historical reasons, with Christianity a distant second and split between Catholics and Protestants. There are also some Hindu groups left over from an even more remote historical past, and countless small tribal groups with their own diverse local religious customs. So Indonesia already offers us an intriguing lesson in religious coexistence because only by maintaining an official national legal framework that guarantees religious freedom for all these groups can they manage to hold the country together. From another angle, there are even more separate ethnic groups in Indonesia than there are religions. Most of the major ethnic groups tend to be identified with one island or another in the Indonesian archipelago, with the populous island of Java contributing the largest group which also dominates the political elite of the country. This brings up another important issue that comes right back home to contemporary American society, where conversations about ethnicity seem to be in the news almost constantly. We talk a lot about ethnic groups and ethnic rights, but most people never get around to saying clearly what ethnic means in the first place. As in Indonesia, it is important to recognize that in the United States, and just in general, Ethnicity is not about physiological, biological differences between people. Different ethnic groups may look different, and sometimes they do, but for example, nobody in the Balkans can tell the difference between ethnic Serbs and ethnic Croats when you walk down the street in Sarajevo or some other city there. So what is ethnicity if it is not race or some other physiological classification? The key point to keep in mind is that the ethnos, or multitude, which is what the word means in the original Greek, is a group of people. Recognizing that you belong to such a group is a way to take advantage of the teamwork that becomes possible when you can trust other people and work together, when you can make life a positive sum game. Now, you certainly have a lot in common with your family, and families often work together and help each other out but even the largest extended family doesn't qualify as an ethnic group. In fact, ethnicity is a way to recognize a wider shared community 
that can bring a collection of different powerful family groups together under one ethnic umbrella, instead of mistrusting each other and fighting like the Hatfields and McCoys. But how do you manage this? The common bonds that unite members of an ethnic group most often involve sharing a language, like French or English in Canada, or a religion like Catholics and Protestants in Ireland, or Hindus and Buddhists in Sri Lanka, or Jews and Muslims and Christians in medieval Spain. So religion, our focus here, turns out to be, in many cases, one of the fundamental building blocks of what it means to be ethnic. In addition to language and religion, other unifying factors can also come into play to define an ethnic group such as simply all living together in shared geographic space, like Puerto Rico or Catalonia or Iceland for a long time. Of course, if you don't get around much, just staying together in one place for a long time is liable by itself to start generating a separate linguistic dialect or maybe even a separate version of religion. Sometimes these ethnic groups become much more aware of their common identity and may get all worked up about it to the extent that they start calling for the crystallization of the group into an actual politically mobilized, self-governing state. This crystallized ethnic group is also known as a nation. The last few centuries have been dominated by a drive all over the world to draw political boundaries around ethnic populations and call them nation states. This drive is very much alive today, with Catalonia trying to break away from Spain on the basis of its distinctive language. Historian William McNeil refers to this powerful historical current as the barbarian ideal of the ethnically homogenous nation. This ideal is what gives rise to ethnic cleansing, when the dominant ethnic group in a country tries to drive out everybody else who does not belong to that group. But Indonesia never should be thought of as a nation state, any more than we can use this label for the United States or Canada or many other politically unitary countries that contain multiple ethnic groups or nations. Although some people carelessly talk about nations as the same thing as countries, we should be careful to use this word in its correct original sense, the sense in which you can refer to the Navajo Nation or the Iroquois Nation or the Cherokee Nation. These were once ethnic populations with shared linguistic, religious, and other cultural roots crystallized into self-governing political systems. That's a nation. Indonesia's fundamental problem is that its leaders, emerging with independence from colonial rulers, got really ambitious and wanted to put together a self-governing political system that spanned an entire archipelago of different islands with different cultures different languages and religious beliefs, in a word, a multi-ethnic population. The riddle they had to solve to make this work was, how do you hold a collection of ethnicities like this together in a single country? We will see what answer they came up with, and since the multi-ethnic problem also occupies a lot of time and attention in American society, we might even want to take notes here. But Jane Atkinson, who became fascinated with Indonesia at an early age and spent a very long time studying it in detail, eventually focused her attention on a different problem. As the ambitious leaders of this vast, newly independent and multi-ethnic nation embarked on their crusade of nation building that has been going on now for several generations, their basic blueprint that we will discuss next did not have space marked on it for all of the incredible cultural diversity to be found across all of these islands in the archipelago. Inevitably, as when you bulldoze land and lay sewers and string power lines to build a new suburb, some features of the landscape are actually going to come under attack. The people that Jane Atkinson studied very closely in person for years constitute some of this cultural landscape that has been threatened by the Indonesian bulldozers of nation building. We'll look at the bulldozers first and then come back to the threatened cultural landscape. To understand the unique blueprint for nation building devised by the first generation of independent Indonesian leaders, first we must pay attention to the long and complex history that left Indonesia with several distinct layers of organized religious traditions. 
Atkinson tries to explain the complex and sometimes inconsistent meanings attached to the word agama, the word in Indonesian for religion. Agama is actually not a local word. It's a very ancient Sanskrit word. Sanskrit was written and spoken in southwestern Asia and the Indian subcontinent more than 3,000 years ago, making it older than the pyramids or classical Latin and Greek. It became the basis for most offshoot languages all over India and Pakistan. What is this old Sanskrit word doing in Indonesia? Ancient trading between India and these islands brought in this and many other new words and ideas, and also gave such words the prestige that goes along with wealth, prosperity, and a cosmopolitan perspective on the world. Some small pockets of Hindu religion have even survived down to the present in parts of Indonesia. So agama not only refers to religion, but to the power of traditions of literacy and high status. Only prosperous, high status people have time for the luxury of complicated religious doctrines. The next wave of religious influence washed over Indonesia like a tsunami in the 1300s, only about seven centuries ago. This wave arrived with Arabic traders, just as the word agama itself had arrived so much earlier. A link with traders who knew about the whole wide world and who brought new ideas and prosperity, as well as new products to sell, guaranteed that religion would be reinforced as something that people associated with high status, wealthy, powerful people. The Muslim tsunami from seven centuries ago still provides evidence of its overwhelming impact and staying power from the simple fact that Islam remains the dominant majority on almost all of the Indonesian islands to this day. Even more recently, about 500 years ago, some Portuguese explorers and traders finally showed up in this part of the world. They came looking for pepper and nutmeg and other spices that would make them rich back in Lisbon, so they mainly established trading communities along the coasts of islands where they could get their hands on these valuable commodities. The word agama was already established for the idea of religion, but a few Portuguese words for other things like butter, cheese, or flags did work their way into the Indonesian vocabulary. More importantly, the Portuguese also brought in the Catholic religion, along with the word for a church. All of these influences again reinforced the idea that the question of religion was intimately tied to these wealthy and powerful visitors arriving from the outside world. Unlike the Muslims, though, this foreign influence of Christianity did not penetrate far into the inland areas of the Indonesian islands where most of the common people lived in their villages. Catholicism still remains mostly a coastal religion in certain parts of the country. Although the Portuguese first brought Christianity into Indonesia, their influence didn't actually last long. By the end of the 1500s, the Dutch East India Company began to take over the spice trade and eventually dominated the entire region. The Dutch not only traded with the locals, but established permanent colonies with transplanted Dutch people who built up businesses and quickly took over the local economies, sometimes with the aid of military force. By the 1700s, the Dutch also began to influence local politics, especially in Java, the most populous island. The modern government of Indonesia, centered today in Jakarta on the island of Java, shows the unmistakable stamp of European ideas of parliamentary politics and a national bureaucracy for administration, along with knots of Dutch vocabulary. But the Dutch were Protestants, of course, not Catholics, and so the other side of the European Christian tradition also spread into the prosperous, educated urban centers throughout the archipelago. Then in the 20th century, it all fell apart. Colonialism collapsed. That ambitious new generation of indigenous leaders found themselves in charge of a new, independent country with a wealth of amazing natural resources and the fourth biggest population on Earth. It was enough to take your breath away. But as we have said, they also found themselves staring squarely down the barrel of a dangerous problem, the problem of competing religions layered through a bewilderingly complicated multi-ethnic population. What would you have done? Testifying to their familiarity with the rest of the modern world, 
as well as with the complexity of the challenge they faced, these indigenous leaders came up with a doctrine that they called Pancasila. The first four principles of this doctrine would be familiar to anybody who has studied the French Revolution or the American Revolution or the independence movements in India or Africa or any other corner of the colonial world. The first rule is nationalism, a commitment to think about Indonesia as a unified country and yourself as one of its citizens. This is one example of playing fast and loose with that word nation, since of course Indonesia could never be described as a single ethnic group crystallized into a self-governing political elite. The goals of these early leaders went far beyond the barbarian ideal, trying to find a way to connect together many ethnic groups into a single country. This difficult goal explains the other three of those first four principles. The second principle is humanitarianism, recognition that the political state exists to make the lives of all its citizens better. If it isn't doing that, is it failing in a fundamental obligation of the state? The third principle of social justice reinforces this idea that all citizens should be equal in the eyes of the law, equal in their duties to and benefits from the government. The fourth principle of democracy is in tune with the others, emphasizing that each individual has the same right as any other to vote and otherwise to help to determine who gets into the government and what they're supposed to be doing. All of these principles are like railroad tracks laid down in one specific direction, a direction that is supposed to make it impossible, for example, for one religion or ethnic group to try to exclude or eliminate or control all the others. It's not perfect, of course, because you still have the problem of the tyranny of a majority. If the number of Muslims or the Javanese ethnic group are big enough, they can use all these principles of democracy and so on to vote themselves into power and then just stay there. Still, they are trying, just as we are in other countries, to solve this same riddle of a multi-ethnic state. But the Indonesians added a fifth basic principle, one that you won't find almost anywhere else. Religion, more specifically the major world religions, had acquired such a pedigree of status and power over the centuries that the new Indonesian leaders decided they would try to harness the power of religion and add it to the list of tools they were using to weld together their new country. That salience of religion appears if you ask the standard question about how important your religion is in your life. The answers in Indonesia suggest that here, religion is more important than almost anywhere else in the world. The designers of Pancasila did not choose just one religion, though they easily could have settled on Islam as by far the dominant faith. Instead, they declared that everybody should subscribe to some kind of monotheistic religion, the same way they subscribe to the ideas of democracy or social justice or nationalism. It doesn't matter which monotheism you like because they're all guaranteed to be allowed side by side in the new country. But you really ought to get connected to one of these high status groups that have always been indicators of cosmopolitan prestige and power in the world. Yoking together all of these major world religions and getting them pulling together to lead the new Indonesian state forward was an audacious idea and has proved to give the government an extra level of influence not found in most other multi-ethnic countries trying the same experiment. Still, against this background of the bulldozers of the Pancasila principles, when Jane Atkinson went to Indonesia to do her own research, she found those bulldozers running roughshod over some cultural landscape that didn't fit very well with these principles. It's time next to take a look at that landscape. More than for scholars in any other discipline, anthropologists love to study exotic, isolated, small-scale communities. This is not just because they like to travel or because they're bored with contemporary suburban America. While that would be understandable, their preference reflects long-standing concerns that conventional social research collects bits of information from people piecemeal, a few survey questions at a time, taken out of context in isolation from other facts about people's lives. Such an out of context data collection, they say, makes it easy to misunderstand the people being studied. Anthropologists resolved to find settings where they could settle in 
and observe an entire society over an extended period. So naturally, it had to be a fairly small, isolated group. They wanted to take in the whole social context, put each observation in the proper perspective, and understand people's lives as a unified cultural whole. Jane Atkinson learned that research approach in her classes at Bryn Mawr and wanted to try it for herself. With financial support from the school, she took off for the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia to live with and learn about an isolated group called the Tuatawana. The Wana people live on the fringes of an increasingly developed, modernizing Indonesian society. Rather than living in town, they range through the hills, hunting wild pigs and other game, shifting their tiny hand-constructed villages from time to time, and living as they have done for uncounted centuries past. Of course, they no longer are completely isolated from the rest of the world. They make visits to town, wear clothes like other people when they can get them, and have learned all kinds of things about their neighbors, including the fact that some of those neighbors are Muslims and others are Christians. Most of the Wana people, however, have not given up their old traditional ways and have not converted to any of the world religions officially recognized by the Pancasila principles. This desire to remain who they always have been, to live the way they always have lived, generates some tensions with the surrounding Indonesian society. When Jane Atkinson went to live with them and study those traditions, she was expecting the religious aspect of their lives to involve things like special stories about creation, perhaps belief in ancestral spirits, and so on. Instead, she found that when the Wana people talked about agama, about religion, the conversations turned out to be political, all about this tension between the Wana and their neighbors and the larger Pancasila context. She discovered that the Wana were using that word agama as a tool or a weapon in their struggle to preserve their traditional community and way of life. This discovery actually fit in very well with the ideas of one of her anthropological heroes. Clifford Geertz taught that religion, like other social institutions, should be seen not just as some kind of static cultural furniture, but always as a way of solving problems and achieving some kind of cultural goals. And the first goal of any culture must be to survive as a culture. Faced with the nation-building program of the central Indonesian government, on another island far away, the Wana on Sulawesi learned that there was room in the complex Pancasila mosaic for diverse ethnic groups like themselves, but only if they could figure out a way to match up their own traditions and culture with those Pancasila principles. Since religion is such a salient part of Indonesian life, they needed to convince everyone around them that they were following that principle as well as the other four, the principle of monotheism. Now, clearly, they were not Christians, nor were they Muslims, the two dominant monotheisms closely linked to Indonesian nation building. A neighboring tribe that had converted to Islam, perhaps centuries earlier, would accuse them of not following the Pancasila principles and would suggest that they should become Muslims. Another community of Christian neighbors would make the same accusation and advise them to convert to Christianity. In response to assertions that they lack a religion, Atkinson tells us, Wana who have not converted to a world religion contend that they do in fact have a religion. The Wana found out that you don't have to be a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist in order to fit into the Pancasila mosaic. They learned that some local indigenous groups, such as the Dayak people living in the interior forests of the island of Borneo, proved to be strong enough and clever enough to get the central Indonesian government to accept their traditional ceremonies and culture, pictured here, as a legitimate religion. They just had to have some kind of religion in order to live up to that Pancasila principle, so they managed to repackage their traditional beliefs and customs to fit with that principle. The fact that some indigenous groups had been able to do this led the Wana people to try the same strategy. Atkinson found that the Wana were using the idea of agama, or religion, in a quite proactive, entrepreneurial way, turning the religious dimension of Pancasila from a weapon that might be used against them into a tool that they could use to preserve their own distinctive way of life, a shield instead of a spear. 
Whatever their own agama was, this always turned out to be something that made them different from the surrounding social groups that could have swallowed them up. The Muslims won't eat pork. We hunt pigs and love eating pork, and that's part of our agama. The Christians go inside churches and pray to Jesus. We go out in the forest and pray to God in a different way, our own way, and that's also our agama. We're following a religion, following that Pancasilla principle, and in fact, that very principle is the reason why we need to keep on following our own unique traditions and way of life. Jane Atkinson gives us a whole laundry list of these unique cultural features, from diet to burial practices, from medicines to food production, that always use agama as a justification for preserving their Wana identity and community. It remains to be seen whether the Wana will be successful in using religion as a central tool for defining and sustaining themselves as a distinctive ethnic group. But even this attempt brings into sharp focus for us how religion frequently plays a key role in what we mean by ethnicity. The whole concept of ethnicity and ethnic groups, larger than families and bound together by shared language, religion, and other traditions, raises some of the most difficult questions we encounter in human society. The idea of universal human rights has gained a lot of ground in the past century, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, promoted by the United Nations, seeks to extend such rights and freedoms to every individual in the world. But it is one thing to say that you and I, as individual human beings, have certain basic human rights. It is something very different to say that a group of people, for example, an ethnic group like the Wana or the Navajo or the Palestinians, has some kind of collective group rights. Can groups have rights in the same way that individuals do? If a right is simply an obligation for others to treat you in a certain way, what happens if we extend rights to groups as well as to individuals? We can see some examples of such group rights. For example, the parliament in Lebanon reserves half of its seats for Muslims and the other half for Christians. You can only be elected to one of the seats reserved for your religion. The prime minister has to be a Sunni Muslim and the president has to be a Maronite Christian. These religious groups have legal rights as groups, regardless of the individuals that make them up. Some people who benefit from such ideas insist that groups must have collective rights. Other people are not so sure and think that only individuals can have rights. You're going to have to think about this and figure out where you stand on this really difficult and possibly dangerous question.